many wines do you think you taste a year? In the thousands, I don't know, I don't count. Mm. I don't count. So one of the things we were talking about is if, uh, if wine was as simple as a quantitative checking of the box and understanding titratable acidity, pH, uh, alcohol, bricks at harvest, uh, it might be quite easy to mimic this. And in fact, there's a group in uh, Colorado that is trying yeah. to do reverse engineering on uh, popular stylized wines in order to replicate a profile for consumers. Now, uh, I know you and I uh, uh, are near vomiting, uh, been that it's anathema to uh, our experience and expertise, but um, it's not that simple because the reality is there's a qualitative experience and a requirement to taste those thousands of wines to really understand and appreciate. So. Can you put some parameters on that? Can you explain how you developed those skills? What did you learn over time studying with Emile Peno way back when? What were some of the things that you learned? First of all, I agree with you. I don't think you can reduce wine to numbers. Numbers are, with few exceptions, purely quantitative and rarely qualitative. And if anything, I think in a lot of the wines we tasted from the 18 or even the 16 vintage, we're actually nonplussed by the numbers because we, we taste the balance in the wine and then we go back and see, oh my goodness, it was 14 and a half, 15 plus percent. It didn't taste that way. So the numbers are misleading. They're misleading. I, I, I imagine that with the advances in so many fields of science, they will get close to being able to manufacture a wine by the numbers that may be palate pleasing. Who knows? I recall that when I was making the decision between going to UC Davis or coming here to Bordeaux, that what I saw them doing at Davis was trying to make the greatest possible quantity of wine with the fewest possible defects. Wines that were qualitatively flawless, but with nothing exceptional about them. And then I came and visited Bordeaux and talked with people here, and there was no talk about least common denominator. It was all about how can we make better and the best wines ever. I thought that was far more challenging and stimulating, and I chose Bordeaux. And I still remember some of the professors in my first classes saying, oh, wait a minute, you're from California. In fact, your name is Davies, almost Davis. Why didn't you go there? And I said, because I think what you guys are looking for here is a far more interest to me. Okay. So you'd say the people in Bordeaux were pursuing perfection? I think so. Have they achieved it? Occasionally. Is that revealed in a hundred point line? I suppose, yeah. I, I remember some wines that, with Karim we tasted in, in 2016. And we go, wow, that's perfection. How could it get any better? And then we went back to those same properties and tasted the 18s. I go, I don't know how, but it did. It got better. Mm. So even perfection is something you can't reduce to numbers. It's, it's, it's widespread. And I think we've been very, very fortunate with what we've seen in Bordeaux in 15 and 16 and 18. But like I said, when I first came here, I remember back in 75, we thought, you know, included, we'd made some of the best wines ever. We now know that's not the case. So perhaps we'll still make even better wines than what we've made in 15, 16, 18. And plus, there is another factor. I think tastes do change. And so what we think of today as being fantastic, maybe in five or 10 years, taste will have changed again or evolved further, and they'll be looking for something slightly different. We hear all too often, to my taste, but we hear all too often that now the wines are not over-extracted or they're not overly this or overly that or overly oaked, perhaps. But if we didn't test the envelope, we wouldn't know where we needed to come back to. 
And in Bordeaux, 20 years ago, we began testing the envelope. We were doing the model in barrel. We were using 100% new barrels, sometimes even 200% new barrels. And we were pushing ripeness to levels at which it had ne- to which it had never been produ- uh, pushed. But if we didn't do that, how would we know where to come back to? So we've pushed and tested the envelope. I think we've come back to a place where everybody's pretty comfortable. We've gotten away from 100% heavily toasted new oak, and we're using different fermentation vessels, as you know. We've gotten away from oak tanks or cement tanks or stainless steel tanks. On the contrary, we're using a combination of those, plus we've added the amphora, which are made from different clay composites. So we're adding new elements all the time. And they're making, I think, for fresher, brighter, more complex wines, which I think are in line with where tastes are going. But I don't think we ever got as far away from this idea in Bordeaux as they did in some other regions. But I think we're getting back to ever more food-friendly wines. Again, I don't think we got as far away from food-friendly as some other wine regions. Jeffrey, talk to me about the Grand Place. How does it work? I, I'm I'm quite confused because uh, it's somewhat of a traditional system. Very much. And I'm not clear on how it started. And you are you must be one of the few Americans as a negociant, right? Well, I wasn't here when it started. Uh, okay. Well, I believe you. I, I didn't dig any of those ditches that separate the Appalachians. Right, 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 right. Those are the Dutch. Yes. Yes. I want to make that clear. Um, it, it's a system that's probably 350 years old now. And but initi- there's levels of this, yeah. right? You, you so had, can you explain some of that? You, you basically had three levels. You had the chateau. You had the courtier or the brokers, and you had the négociant or the merchants. Initially, the courtiers would scout the countryside, find wines, bring samples back to the merchants in Bordeaux, or in Niborne much later, and the négociants would taste and think this is interesting, and then usually they would buy the wine in barrel, bring it to their cellars, age and blend it, more or less scrupulously, bottle it, and with... And it was labeled under the Negociant label, not it necessarily... It would be Negociant plus Chateau, frequently. Okay. And it, you could have famous Chateaus, but bottled by one of the many Negociants in Bordeaux who existed over time. And this dates back to... 17th century. Uh, I would say 18th, but possibly even 17th. No, I would say 18th. Okay. 18th and 19th. Yeah. Uh, Chateau bottling, as everybody I think knows now, is a relatively recent phenomenon um, where the Chateau ultimately took back some of their authority and power by saying, no, we're not going to sell the wine until we have bottled it, when we feel it's right, when we feel the blend is what we want it to be. And our estate is worthy of distinction. But if I'm not mistaken, my recollection is that Chateau, even as prestigious as Chateau Latour, weren't doing 100% Chateau bottling until probably the 30s, and we're still bottling barrel by barrel, so you can imagine the bottle variation, Mm. into the mid-50s. And they were certainly not unique in that, but uh, the bottling of the blends determined by the Chateau, by the Chateau, at the Chateau, is still a relatively recent phenomenon in wine terms because uh, at best it's 70 odd years old and in many cases even more recent. So the négociants today, the merchants, are rarely buying wine in barrel, bringing it into their cellars, aging and blending it to their guys, and then marketing it. With one exception, the, the so-called marque or branded wines, like a Mouton Cadet or what have you, where 
the companies are buying from the so-called co-ops all over Bordeaux, and maybe from a few independent growers, and they are blending the wines in their cellars in substantial quantities and taking out a brand name and marketing it, Mouton Carré being the most successful of those, because I think they're at 1.2 or 1.4 million cases of Mouton Carré today. I mean, mm. it's just huge. And I, I take my hat off to them because uh, to come up with consistent quality that is uh, recognizable as a style year in and year out, for that quantity of wine, I think it's an amazing feat. And I, I don't look down at them at all. I, I think it's admirable that they're able to do that. But it's not my passion. My passion is, as we've said, it's more to the artisanal grower who's hands-on making his wine, trying to make the best from his terroir that he possibly can. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, and that's one of the levels. It's the producer, the chateau. Explaining the, the, the number of hands. So there's a winery, then there's a courtier, then there's negociants. In America, there's an importer, then there's a distributor, and then there's a retailer. Mm. That's a lot of hands in the pie. Yeah, and I, I suppose it would be a long debate as to how much each of that each of those pairs of hands add to the value um, so we kind of have a three-tier system here in Bordeaux, Chateau, Courtier, Négociant, and you have a three-tier system in the United States, importer, wholesale distributor, retailer, or restaurateur. Right. But I think both in the United States, the, the lines are beginning to blend, and frequently the wholesaler is the importer selling to the retailer, but often the retailer either has a wholesale license or has a cooperative wholesaler importer who will bring wines, clear wines, in to him. So the traditional three-tier system for Bordeaux wine, I'm not talking about all the rest, I think the lines have, have uh, tended to disappear between them. And well, it's a condensing of margins necessarily to be more competitive. I think that's a part of it. I think, though, that by virtue of the fact that first Diageo decided to get out of the Bordeaux wine market game by basically ending Chateau and Estate, that sent shockwaves through the market and as a consequence Southern Wine and Spirits, who was the biggest distributor in the country, decided that it too would pretty much get out of the Bordeaux wine business and and a lot of wine was purchased in the United States and brought back to Bordeaux or put into warehouses for sale later so that the whole market just didn't crash. I think that the system had one advantage that we have lost. The wholesalers would also would not only sell to retailers, but they would also sell to restaurants. Today there are very few, few wholesalers in the United States selling to restaurants. And so Bordeaux has lost, I would say, 85% of its presence on restaurant wine lists and is now basically sold to the retail chains, uh, or chain of distribution, I mean. There was also a change, though, that affected a lot of that. The, the trickle down was that the wineries um, raised prices in order to keep more of the margin themselves, and they held back inventory in order to see what the marketplace would pay for those wines over time. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, uh, I think they, mm -hmm. the top growths in particular enriched themselves and made good decisions economically for themselves. Uh, but the, what you, you've seen is, is the consumers and the intermediaries, the wholesalers and importers, decrying the the end of the Bordeaux uh, futures campaign and the end of the Bordeaux uh, investment as an opportunity. What's your perspective on that? It's a much talked about subject and has been probably for the last 10 years, um, especially since the shock waves that came from Diageo Southern and so forth, getting basically out of the Bordeaux wine business. We all know that there are several reasons 
to pursue futures. One is that when the wine is bottled and becomes for sale on the market, it may no longer be available because the production may have been small. Small production limited allocation, sure. Snapped up. Another reason is if you're a fan of special format bottles, basically buying them on premier is the only way to ensure that you will have them. And thirdly, of course, is the fact that you believe that the wine will gain in value between the time you buy it on futures, you receive it delivered, and thereafter. Yeah. Do you, I mean, it makes sense to me, but what do you think? Uh, do you think buying something 18 to 24 months in advance of receiving delivery uh, confers a discount? Uh, I'm not sure the word would be confer, but that you put your money up front should hopefully allow you to have a reasonable return when that product is delivered. Whether or not you're buying Bordeaux futures as investment grade opportunities, I would argue if I'm parting with my money today and not getting delivery in 24, 18 to 24 months, right. I would expect some sort of discount. As a consumer, well, I think the discount is the futures price because theoretically, theoretically, that's between that's the quotes. The price you pay on theoretically futures and the price you pay for the delivered wine, there should be there should be about a twenty point spread, which minimum, would, yeah, which would more than justify the investment <clears throat> given the cost of money today. Now, if the cost of money were still high, ten percent or more, then the equation would be more difficult to satisfy or to balance. But today with money costing one or two percent, three maybe in the US, depending. Yeah. So we're talking about inflationary costs. <clears throat> but if you even if you if you, if you even if you benefited on a twenty percent, which may be fifteen on a on a first growth, uh, and then you factored in the cost of inflation, two to three for two plus years, you know, suddenly I'm paying, uh, maybe maybe I get an 8%, 9-10% discount. Well, when you ask the no, question. I would say you get an 8-9% to return on a 24-month investment, which unless That's you're... if you sell the wine and there's a buyer on right. the other side, and if you're an individual or, consumer... Or if you keep it, then it's a discount. I could see you saying that, yes. Yeah. But, I mean, I imagine Warren Buffett would be pretty happy with that return. You're obviously not a Berkshire Hathaway shareholder. <laughs> 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 much but, uh, expectations. <laughs> the, the, the sole reason for buying futures being a speculative one is not, is not my motivation. Um, for encouraging people to buy. No, sure. Yeah, going back to the argument of access, allocation, exactly. unlimited supply. Line. And then formats and so forth. Um, if people are in it purely for speculative reasons, then they take the risk. And what happens, happens. Agreed. And uh, we've all, I think, been pretty fortunate in that over the past couple decades, particularly in the great vintages, the returns have tended to be there, which is an added bonus to the high quality of the wines. They continue to improve and bottle over time. So it's like a dual bonus. But then there's Chateau Latour that said thank you, but no thanks to the whole Grand Place system. They're still selling to negociants, but the idea of releasing their wines at a discount on Premier, they said, no, we're good. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that uh, they watched that Orson Welles commercial where he said, we'll sell no wine before it's time. Mm -hmm. And they realized that if they put the wine in their setters, until the wine was theoretically ready to drink, that they would make or reap a lot of that return that otherwise the intermediate trade right. and the consumer would. Yeah. Um, it's a very ambitious and audacious approach. I think it's still a bit early to say how successful the approach will be or has been. Um, but, One thing that did but, happen, but, but, but they looked at the immutable law of supply and demand and said, we will restrict supply and demand will remain high and we will set higher prices as a result. 
we, well, I don't know if they'll set them, but they, they hope to fetch them at any rate. One negative impact that that whole approach did take is that for many of us négociants who had bought Latour traditionally when it came out on futures and, and decided to hold a portion of it back for sale later, well then when Latour started late releasing from their own setters some of the same vintages that we had been carrying, Consumers around the world would say, well, wait a minute, is this the late release from the Chateau or is this from your setter? Why well, if it's from our négociant setter? We've had the wine since it was released. Oh, well, I really prefer to have it direct from the Chateau setter. And then they went a step further. They put special proof tags on the capsules and bottles mm. for the late release from the Chateau so that our wine suddenly took a hit. That sounds like an Asian phenomenon. Were Americans doing that? Were Americans responding in kind? Oh, yeah. To a, perhaps to a lesser extent, yes. Mm. But they still were. They still were, yeah. No, oh, just because there's been so much counterfeiting in particular and, uh, around these wines. I don't have anything against the proof tag and other similar systems, nothing. But it suddenly put us in the awkward position of having bought the wine on futures, held it in our cellars, right. and then suddenly right. be told, well... Thank, you, thank you very much, Latour. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Tell me... You've, you, you've, you've really spent more of your life in France than America at this point, haven't you? Yes, I crossed that, that, that line are, are some you, years ago. Are you a, a dual citizen? No, just American. You're still American passport. Mm. So, what has it been like? It's, uh, because it's, it's there's like, lots of Grant, there's lots like, of perception. It's just like being married. You can't be faithful to more than one wife. Is that right? That was a rhetorical question, right? I don't have to answer. <laughs> How can I be faithful to more than one flag at a time? Uh, well, there's plenty of dual citizens, but... Um, can you be faithful to more than one flag at a time? My question relates to... <laughs> What has it been like to be uh, American in uh, uh, France? Have you encountered challenges? Well, yeah, I mean, because many of the leading Nicotian in Bordeaux, their families have been at this for two and three hundred years. And there's a bit of silver spoonism. I certainly didn't have that. When I started as a negociant, I had basically nothing. Uh, as I told you earlier, I really started as a journalist, writing about wine, which was and still is my passion, and gradually, slowly, transformed that into a negociant business, a wine merchant business. Um, but there's no silver spoon. There's no family that's been here for several hundred years. So it's all been thanks to my own passion and hard work. And, you know, I would make a distinction too. You say, well, what's it like being an American in France? That's one thing. What's it like being an American in Bordeaux is another thing. Because Bordeaux is a very closed and insular society. And I don't think if you're not native-born and been here for a long time, you're ever fully accepted. Mm -hmm. People say the same thing about growing, being going to Boston. Well, I, c I could understand that because it is a, an old traditional American city, one of the oldest American cities, and so they want to know that you came over on the Plymouth, mm -hmm. uh, or on the, over to Plymouth Rock on the Mayflower, rather. Sure. Um, there's a bit of that here, and I suppose I could let it bother me, but that wouldn't be very productive, so I don't, and I'm... You know, as you know, I'm married to a French woman, and but her family was not in the wine business, and thanks to her, largely speak the language fluently, and probably better than most of the people here because I hear it differently, and all kinds of word combinations and plays on words occur to me that don't immediately occur to the locals. Do you say we oui or we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I have fun with the language and I play with it and, and that's, that's always been interesting. Um, Do you miss America? Well, yes and no. I mean, I go back frequently and, and 
sometimes when I have to get on the plane in San Francisco, they have to put a couple people behind me to push me into the plane. But, mm. but I think anywhere you live or just about, there are pros and cons, and the trick is to is to concentrate and to focus on the pros and not be obsessed by the cons, otherwise you're going to be miserable wherever you are. For sure. And Bordeaux and France both have a hell of a lot to offer. I think of France kind of as a, 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 a concentrated version of California. I mean, we have the oceans and the rivers and the lakes and the mountains and the vineyards, all of which you have in California as well, our, our native states. And I'm not sure it's your native state, but it is mine. And and, um, Texan by birth. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> but France obviously has 2,000 years more history and culture For sure. than California does. But I, I mean, I love both places. And you know, you say United States, but I think mostly of California because that's where I'm from and that's my probably favorite state in the United States. And there's so many beautiful places in that state, too. And uh, <laughs> I, I always love driving from San Francisco in the Bay Area down to UCSB, Santa Barbara. And what's so amazing to me today is, as we talked about earlier, when I used to drive down there, there wasn't a vine anywhere to be seen. And now, from what is it, King City all the way to south of Santa Barbara, on both sides of 101, there are vines as far as you can see. And some damn good wines being made. I think you're making some of them. Thank you. We are. Um, it's, just, it's just amazing the changes that have gone on there as well. Um, but I think you have to look at the positives wherever you are, not dwell on the negatives, because it would be easy to get despondent. For sure. I prefer not to be. Jeffrey, thank you so much for your time. This was a fantastic, engaging, and illuminating discussion. Thank Chin -chin you. And best thank wishes. You. Thank you for taking the time to come by and see us.